I really try to warn caregivers is you're going to have to create your own support group, whether it's go find one at a hospital or a doctor's office. In my case, it was Facebook. Uh, I already had, you know, a following of thousands of people for being on the radio and writing books, that sort of thing. Um, but you must find a support system. And a lot of the people that you think are going to be there, my mom had some of the closest, most amazing friends. She was a tennis player. So it was her tennis group and they were together for what, 20, 30, 40 years. And they pretty much disappeared. I think a lot of that is because it's so uncomfortable and it's so sad and they don't know what to do. And it's their friend and it looks like Fran and they've come to visit Fran and it's Fran's laugh, but that's not Fran. Fran doesn't have any idea who they are. Mm -hmm. um, so they, they just stopped coming. Um, but you have to learn to, to that this is going to happen mm -hmm. and don't take it personally. Um, forgive these people later on. I didn't think I ever would, uh, but I'm not much of one to harbor a grudge. And the more I learned about the disease, I, the more I learned about, you just have to forgive these people and move on. Um, but find a group, you got to find somebody that's there for you. Yeah, make a like family. You. Yeah. Yeah. Mm -hmm. You have to make a family. And also I, th I think which is interesting and, and people won't do this. We talked about this when we chatted or, um, earlier was, you know, you have to tell people what you need. And that's one of the hardest things for caregivers to do because you don't even know what you need. Um, but I, one thing I wish my father had done is these friends that dropped off. I wish he'd said, I, I need you to, to just show up if you, even if just for me. Because I don't really, I don't even think they realize it. They don't, they have no idea that what they're doing is so uh, hurtful. Right. Yeah. Right. You, and uh, there were many times I wanted to reach out, uh, you know, but it was also uncomfortable for mom. I think I remember taking her to the, the country club to meet all these tennis players and have a lunch one day mm -hmm. and I, you know, I didn't realize it. Uh, she, she seemed a little bit off on the way there, but she also seemed genuinely excited. But it was only once we were really in the luncheon with all these loud ladies who were laughing and talking and having a great old time, at the, you know, everybody talking at the same time, that I realized mom couldn't follow the conversation and she didn't know who they were. Mm -hmm. They looked familiar at this point. Mm -hmm. but she was very frightened to tell me she didn't know who they were because she didn't want to hurt my feelings. That was the kind of person my mom was. She always took care of everybody else. Um, and I'm sure it frightened her a little bit, but she was really concerned to tell me she didn't. So I got up to help her go to the ladies room at some point. And she goes, now remind me again, who these ladies, these are your friends, right? And I just said, yeah, yeah. And they love to play tennis. You know, you played tennis. Oh yeah. Oh yeah. That's what she would say. Oh yeah. Oh yeah. Mm -hmm. So, because she thought she still played tennis pretty much until the end. Wow. Well, there's a story that you taught that you talk about your mom loving peanut M Ms. Oh Lord, and... they became weapons. <laughs> oh no. <laughs> but in the beginning, when she was, it was like she rediscovered something she loved every time she ate it. And... Well, she had peanut M Ms. She always had a. She always had a little. She was a jeweler, so she had those little those little baggies like you would buy beads in or whatever. Mm -hmm. She was a jeweler. So she always had these little baggies around for diamonds and jewelry or whatever. And so she would put, she would fill these little bags with peanut M&Ms. And then when she was headed out each day to go to her jeweler or whatever, she, or the grocery store or whatever, she'd grab a bag of these and throw them in her purse. She always had peanut M&Ms. And as she was starting to, as, as the effects of Alzheimer's were starting to take effect, and, and, and we didn't even know it at this point. I could not get her to stop feeding them to the dog. And the, the uh, dog's probably in here somewhere. The dog is almost 18 and has more energy than any of us. So don't tell me, please don't go feed your dog chocolate. But this dog is apparently an alien. Nothing is going to kill it. It is still around here somewhere. Um, but yeah, I just, uh, it was Halloween she was, it was Halloween later that year. And, you know, that's when you can buy the individual packages. Uh -huh. And so I thought, oh, I'm going to grab some of those. Mom will love those. Like, mom, look what I got. It was the little individual packages. And she went, 
what are those? And my heart just sunk. Mm -hmm. And how could she not know? And I said, well, try one. And she did. She was like, oh, these are good. And it's like, so you had to reframe it as, okay, that's really sad. Mom doesn't remember she likes peanut M&Ms. But look at the joy of, mm -hmm. we got to see her joy in eating a peanut M&M for the first time again. Yeah. You have to, you have to, you have to find new joys. Well, I love that. And, and Kim had just typed in reframing is so important. That seemed to be a really big go-to for you that, that once you learned how to reframe things, the stress just kind of went off. Um, do you, are you, do you find yourself still using it and how do you do it? Um, I had to learn to do it with her because her very being and survival had become my job. Not so much physically, because I was fortunate enough to be able to pay to have her in independent living, then assisted living, then memory care, that sort of thing, and then a private home. But I was responsible for, for all of that. So I had to do whatever I could. I, I wasn't reframing so much for me as I think I was reframing to make sure I stayed that everything stayed as stress-free for her as I possibly could make it. Because I swear to this day, she was still in there somewhere and I could see it in the fear in her eyes of what has happened. You know, that was my mom's dirty little secret. She hated old people. She would see somebody in a wheelchair or on a walker and she, well, if they just walk every once in a while, they'd be fine. I'm like, well, no mom, they wouldn't, but... <laughs> You know, and that was the other thing. That was another thing. She was like Jeff Gordon in the hallways. If somebody got in her way, first she wouldn't use a walker and, and then she would carry the walker with her everywhere. And then she started using the walker. But if people got in her way, she would bump these people because she was still spry. She was still moving pretty fast. And I'm like, mom, you can't just bump somebody. She's like, I didn't. I was like, I saw you. And she'd just grin and go, oops, <laughs> but she was like ramming people in the hallways. It's like, stop. It's so amazing how different and, and what shifts and changes. So I'm really curious about, you know, now that you've had some time to kind of look back and, and reflect, what would you have done differently, if anything? Oh, I ask that question all the time. Um, I would have had I don't know. I'm pretty anal retentive. I'm pretty organized. When my husband's father died, I was so impressed that when, when Dr. Charlie died, he had taken care of everything. I mean, down to what flowers, what, I mean, so all we had to do was just eat and drink and be merry and tell stories about Abuelo. Mm -hmm. um, and it was so less stressful finance. Everything was taken care of the paperwork, everything. Um, and I came home at that point in time and my mom and dad, like most people, um, pushed back. And it was like, you know, no, I'm not trying to kill you off. What I'm telling you is this, if you love me, you will take care of this now. So we got my name on all the bank accounts. We got my name on all the, any sort of financial accounts. I knew passwords. I knew everything except for one question. If you become incapacitated, you can't live with me. Where do you want to live? And as this got worse and worse, she kept going, are, are we going to your house? Are we going to your house? And then she would fight us when I had to take her back to assistant. We'd bring her over for dinner or whatever. She would fight us. And the guilt to this day is overwhelming. But I had a multi-level Frank Lloyd Wrightish kind of house. There was no way. I remember I was cooking dinner one night and I looked over and she started to go down the steps and she fell. Mm -hmm. And I, to this day, do not know how I got over to that side of the kitchen and the steps that fast. It was just three steps from the kitchen to the living room. But I caught her and cradled her head like superwoman about a, a, about an inch from the slate before she would have slammed down. I, I cushioned her. It's like I slid. I ran and I slid under her and cupped her. And I, I don't know why it didn't hurt me either. Um, but that was the tremendous, tremendous guilt yeah. still to this day that we never talked about that because she would laugh and say, I'm just going to stay with you. I'm like, oh, hell no, you're not. But it was always a joke. 
and we would laugh. And then she'd go, and you're going to take care of the dog. And I'm like, no, I'm not. The damn dog is still here somewhere. 